This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Now in its seventh year, talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, this is Alex Bennett, and this is the Ramble, and we go until midnight tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Bubbles Brown. Yes. 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 How you doing, Larry? Good, good. I was thinking about, we were talking about uh, entertainment the last time, and uh, we, you know, show business is such a uh, crapshoot to get anywhere, and uh, you always see people that are really good that make it, but sometimes people that are really lame make it. <laughs> I wondered if you had any uh, uh, names that come to mind that well, people have gotten uh, the, really uh, the, big. Uh, the, like, uh, the, the, the I can't tell if anyone's a bad actor or a good actor, but who's like a bad actor? Well, forget really about bad for? actors. First of all, you talk, talk about people who are bad, but uh, and I immediately, the first name that always comes to mind is Perry Kurtz. <laughs> Well, Perry's not like a big star. No, Perry tried to be a big star. His biggest moment was being on uh, what was that? Matt? What was the dating game thing show where they they went send people out on dates and they came back and talked uh, about love him. connection. Love connection. He goes on stage to this day and plays his love connection tape as part yeah. of his act. You know. Hmm. <laughs> but. Um, he was he was not funny, but you're talking about people who made it now. People that made it big that really didn't have a lot going for him. Uh, let me see. There, I came up with somebody the other day, and I can't. Remember. Well, okay, this is going to sound terrible, folks, because you don't you don't speak ill of the dead. But Louis Anderson. Oh, really? I never could see why Louis Anderson had a career. I hadn't seen him in years, but when I when he first started, I I liked his stage persona. It was just so relaxed. I remember I liked that. Yeah, but but was he funny? Ah, long pause. I'll ha- I'll have to look. I haven't seen him. I literally haven't seen him since the eighties. I'll have to. Look. Yeah, but people exactly. told me he was hilarious. Uh, well, uh, you, could, you could fly by me. I mean, this is a guy I think who always survived. He's probably very well liked, okay. And if you're well liked, you get work, whether you're good or bad. If you're easy to work with, yes. exactly. And he's probably easy to work with. Probably was not a prima donna or anything else. And uh, I mean, I assume he was a very nice guy, you know. But I never found him funny. Uh, uh, on the other hand, Bob Saget, I found very funny. Mm-hmm. You know, and I see why he had success. Um, he should have had more success than he had. Okay? And he had, people say, well, he had a TV show and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but that, that ran for eight years and then his career stopped. You know, at least in the public eye. And um, uh, I think he deserved more. I think he was better than that. All right? Uh, a lot of uh, how about comedians that, that you know that should have made it that didn't, you know, big. I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, uh, the funniest guys never make it huge usually. You know why the, the comics comics? They're exactly. The, they're yeah. the comics that comics laugh at, and that's that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, but it doesn't get you famous. I mean. We, we always talk about our friend Jeremy Kramer. Nobody out there knows who we're talking about when I say Jeremy Kramer. But if I talk to somebody in the comedy business and I say Jeremy Kramer, they go, oh, he's, he's hilarious. The best, yeah. Yeah. But he, and, and I, think, I think that kind of poisoned his career, that idea that he was the, uh, you know, the funniest guy around. You know, or what a genius that it, it kind of hobbled him. Uh, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it makes it, it makes it hard. you got a lot to live up to when people are saying you, things you, like that. You have to live up to your reputation or you live on your reputation. 
I mean, everybody says you're great, so why should you work hard? You're good as you are. But you've got to have one other factor, and that's pushing yourself. And that's where we get into that territory of people, as you said, who you, you say to yourself, well, I never thought they were funny, or I never thought they were a good actor, or whatever, is these are people who just push themselves, you know, and push themselves on people. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know. Um, um, but I'm trying to think of some, some people I know of who, who were not particularly good, uh, but they knew how to push themselves. They knew how to push themselves. Uh, well, uh, acting-wise, I would think of Schwarzenegger would Schwarzenegger is a good, a good, a very good, uh, and I was surprised when he became a star. You know, I mean, why did he become a star? There was no reason for him to. Couldn't act, looked funny, sounded funny, had a name <laughs> you couldn't pronounce, right? So, I mean, uh, that being the case, uh, it uh, it was, uh, you know, it was. Uh, Amazing that Arnold Schwarzenegger made it, but he was driven. Someone said he had more drive than anyone they ever saw. Yeah, and so sometimes it's you know we know comics, for instance. I, I, I Bob Rubin. Okay, mm-hmm. I think you and I both agree. Very funny comic, right? And yeah, most unique. Yes, ha- has absolutely no drive. I'll tell you another one who has absolutely no drive. Larry Bubbles Brown. <laughs> I've got a little. I got a little more than Rube. <laughs> yeah, but not enough to. You know, I mean, when you wait twenty years to go back to the Dave, or is it twenty one? Back to 21. the Dave, back to the <laughs> David Letterman show after you were asked after the first time to just get another five minutes and come back. You know, uh, that's not that's not what I would call drive. Looking back, that may have been a mistake. <laughs> well, I mean, everybody everybody sits around. Saying about Larry Bubbles Brown, he, he 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 was twenty years, twenty one years between shots on the Letterman show. He never went back. <laughs> and the only thing, the reason I think you went back is because everybody was admonishing you for not going back. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I mean, but but some people have the drive. You know, some people are just like they're they're relentless in pursuing their career. Yeah, I think uh, people in entertainment, it, most uh, creative people don't have good business sense. The ones that do, that can follow up on all this crap and stay on it, those are the ones that tend to get ahead, I think. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what happened to me once. Uh, there was a uh, there was a guy on uh, KSFO, his name was Gene Nelson. Do you remember Gene Nelson at all? Uh, from Yeah, from the odd, uh, he followed... Uh, uh, Don Sherwood. By the way, I can't remember the name YouTube today when I was trying to bring up YouTube, but I can remember <laughs> Gene Nelson. Okay. Gene Nelson, yes. I, I heard him on the radio when I first moved here. Right. So now I'm uh, I'm fired from one radio station. I can't remember which one. Uh, maybe if I might have been the first time I, I, I was let go at the Live 105. It might be, or it might be earlier than that. It might might be the time I wasn't working uh, because of uh, the quake. But anyway. I'm uh, I'm I'm out of work. Okay, the alarm goes off in the morning, and it's Gene Nelson on the radio. And the first thought that comes to my mind is, how come he's working and I'm not? Because <laughs> this was the most terrible radio I had ever heard. Okay, and this guy lasted forever. Their guy, people in the Bay Area. Lamont and Tonelli. I mean, people who are mediocre. <laughs> I think they're still on. <laughs> yeah, they're still on. I've been gone out of San Francisco for what, 30 years or something? I don't know how many years have I been gone. <laughs> and Lamont and Tonelli are still there. Um, uh, Sarah of Sarah and Vinny still has a job. Again, another case of mediocre radio. And I'm going. I guess my problem in radio was I wasn't mediocre enough. Uh, mediocre always survives. Yeah, and these people, by the way, they just admitted Lamont and Tonelli into the Bay Area Hall of Fame, where I've been a member. I've been, you know, I was brought into it in when, God, I think 
2008. 2008, yeah. I, I and, was and, there. And, and eventually now here in 2021, Lamont and Tonelli get in there, and I'm going, boy, they must be running out of people. <laughs> I guess you just get into the Hall of Fame by never leaving, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's what you want to know about what I consider mediocre. Those are, those are mediocre talents, you know. I mean, God bless them. Somebody listens to them. You know, somebody likes them. Somebody loves them. Um, you know, and, but they, I think you, you go for broke. You go to do the best possible show you can do and the most unusual and different and whatever. Uh, you don't just sit around and try and be mediocre for 25 years. Yeah. But... They've still got a job, and I don't. Well, you survived a uh, – radio is a horrible business like comedy. <laughs> well, I probably had a harder time surviving. I mean, I did survive. I got to tell you, I mean, if you consider that I was still doing you know, radio up until I was about 74, okay, or 73 or 74 – um, that's a pretty long career. Most people are out of radio by that time. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm just, I just, I just wonder why. And I think the problem was is because I, my show was whatever I did was so different that the only people who understood it were the people who were listening to it, the audience. The, yes. the management of radio stations never understood me. You know, never understood what I was doing. It was just a little too off kilter for them. And so because I didn't appeal to the people in suits who ran the radio stations, I had a harder time of surviving. You yeah, know? The, <laughs> the people in the suits are always the one that runs those industries into the ground, too. Well, you got to realize, folks, your TV shows and all the stuff you see on TV is, is really determined by a bunch of people who have no talent whatsoever. Sure, yeah. Their only talent is making money for their 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 overseers. And uh, in that they are loved and considered great in the business. You know. Um, but very seldom have I ever I have I ever worked for somebody who truly admired talent. Uh, I worked for a guy at Sirius XM named Mel Carmazon. Mel Carmazon was the guy who found Howard Stern. And I had an opportunity years early to work for him. But in that time uh, when I went back to Live 105, I got an offer to go work for Mel Carmazan at WJFK in, uh, in, in outside of Washington. I can't remember. It was like Baltimore or somewhere like that. And um, I went, we actually went to uh, Washington to talk to the general manager of the station and talk about the whole thing. And... Uh, we, I was supposed to go. I just had to. I just had to quit Live 105 in order to do it. Um, and I just decided I, I don't want to work for Mel Karmas. And geez, you know, I've heard horrible things about this guy. Well, I didn't realize the horrible things were from general managers because he would go into a town where he owned a radio station or whatever, and just take the general manager and rake him over the coals. You know, profits are not high enough. Blah 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 blah. blah but that he was a talent-driven executive. He was a guy who just absolutely admired talent, but I didn't know that. Really? I didn't, wow. I didn't know that then, but when I went to Sirius XM, he came in as the head of Sirius XM, and I went, well, I'm out of here because it's Mel Carr. And no, quite the opposite. Mel was talent. He admired talent, and he would do everything to support talent. And that was uh, the first time I ever saw in management a guy who actually, um, uh, you know, respected talent. And uh, he, uh, one day I, I hadn't, you know, I'd never met up with him, but one day I'm up in the up in the break room and there's Mel. So I figured, eh, what the hell, I better go over and introduce myself. So I go over, he said, Mel, uh, you may not know me, but uh, I'm Alex Bennett, and I work at uh, Sirius X, here at Sirius XM at uh, the Progressive Station. And he went, oh, Alex Bennett, I'm a big fan. Wow. I mean, what a way for you to meet your boss. You know, and he used the term fan. 
He didn't use a term like, oh, yes, I've heard your work and I like it. You know, it's, I'm a fan. Mm-hmm. And then we talked for a couple of minutes and I suddenly realized the reason I was there and continued to be there was because of Mel. That's great. And once Mel left, I felt my job was in jeopardy. And eventually okay. it was. But if Mel were still there, I don't. I think I'd still be at Sirius XM. You know, so, so where did he wind up going? He wound up just, I think, retiring, just retiring. You know, just not. He didn't go on to any other radio job. He could have. He probably could have taken any radio job he wanted to. But uh, I think he was just tired of it. You know, and I think he had made enough money. He made a fortune off of Stern. Made a fortune. Uh, off of uh, whatever time he spent at Sirius XM, I think his salary was something incredible. Yeah, you know. So he probably just remember, said... Okay. His name was feared in radio, I remember that. <laughs> well, there was always a story about Mel Carmenson, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but it was meant to exemplify who every, a lot of people considered Mel Carmenson was. And that was that he was... Uh, uh, this uh, general manager from one of his radio stations walking down... Th- Fifth Avenue, and on the other side of the street, Mel Carmazan is walking and sees this guy, and starts running out into the middle of the street, yelling, "You son of a bitch! You son of a bitch!" And the guy <laughs> yells out, "Mel, you're going to be hit by a car!" And he yells back, "No car hits Mel Carmazan until I say he can." <laughs> Now, I don't know if that's a true story, but a lot of people use that to kind of exemplify his management technique. He was hell on his sales department. He was hell on his general managers. But when it came to talent, we were gold. I've never seen anything like it in my life, and and I really appreciate it. You know, and it was great to work under somebody like that because he understood what I was doing. Well, people like him would have kept radio alive. Well, you know, he gave us Howard Stern, um, which is not a bad thing. I mean, Howard is a talent, okay, and he recognized it, and he was willing to stand by him. This was the guy who, when when uh, when Howard. Uh, got hit by all kinds of fines from the FCC. Mel said, I'm not going to pay it. Let's go to court. You know? And they weren't, they weren't huge, gig- I think they were, gig- they were large fines, but they weren't gigantic fines. And he just said, I'm not going to put up with this. And he went to court and he won. He, he defended what Howard was doing on the air. Now, I have never never saw anything like that in my life. Because in my life, and in the life that I led, if I ever got into trouble and the FCC uh, wanted to find the radio station for something I had done, they'd fire me. They'd fire you, yeah. You know, they'd get rid of me. Rather than go and defend me and defend their right to have me on their air. So that's why I came to appreciate Mel Karmas, and it's probably one of the best... J- Best owners and managers of a radio organization ever. Wow, that's great. I never knew that about him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, he went out and he... Howard would not be what Howard is today if it weren't for Mel Carmison. Now, of course, Howard doesn't want to admit that, but it's true. Because he's the guy who went to bat for him against the FCC and wouldn't fire him under any circumstances. And and if Howard had been fired at any point during that, if when the uh, the FCC had come along with the fines and they had bailed out by saying, oh, well, let's get rid of them or uh, whatever, uh, let's not challenge the fines, Howard wouldn't be anything today. He would have lost his job and nobody else would have wanted to hire him. Yeah. So Mel Carmazan is, is to be lauded as a guy who stood up for his, uh, for his talent. I just, I, 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 you know, I was so wrong not to go to work for him at WJFK. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's Baltimore, maybe. Uh, yeah, it could be Baltimore. Uh, it was right outside of Washington, D.C. And they wanted to syndicate me and do everything. And I, the last minute, decided I had a loyalty to Live 105, right? Yeah. And that I was going to stay there. And so I stayed there. And then the station was sold. Guess to who? Mel Carmazan. 
And uh, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and what he wanted to do was get Howard in there. And so that's why I was kind of asked to leave, you know. Because Howard was on in in uh, in uh, San Jose, on the, on the San Jose, Infinity yeah. Station in San Jose. And um, he was on down there, and uh, he couldn't get ratings. He, he couldn't even come close to beating me. So the best way to do it is buy the radio station, get rid of me, put somebody in in the meantime, kind of a space filler called Johnny Steele, then fire Johnny Steele and put in uh, put in Howard. Then Howard won't have the onus of having knocked off Alex Bennett to get the job. You get what I'm saying? That's what happened, yeah. 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 So that's basically what happened, yeah. So I mean, it, it, it was uh, that was the uh, that was the whole that was the whole deal, you know. Um, uh, and but 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 you know, so Mel Carmenson may have been the reason that I got kicked out of San Francisco, but it was all for business reasons, you know. That I under, that I can kind of understand, right? But when it came time to standing up for me when I and believing in me when I went to Sirius XM, he was there. And he okay. believed in me. So, what the hell? You know, that's, excuse me, I'm pontificating on my career. Let's talk about yours. <laughs> no, I like uh, radio. It's, uh... What? What? Where did your career go wrong? Let, let, <laughs> where did uh, it go well, wrong? wait a minute. I'm not saying that you had a bad career, but I'm saying where did you make the mistakes that pre- prevented you from being, oh, I don't know, uh, Louis C.K.? Because you would have pulled out your penis eventually. So anyway, uh, no, no. Uh, yes, but I I would have asked permission. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, well, he did too. So yeah. You know. uh, what what what? what where, where did you? I mean, I'll tell you where I fucked up was not taking that job at WJFK. Okay, well that's, okay. I can cut mine just like that. My biggest mistake was I did my first Letterman and went okay and I should have moved to LA and I did I stayed here yeah. stayed in Mayberry and because it was comfortable <laughs> yeah yeah which I think that's probably why you stayed here and didn't go to WJFK right it was comfortable well it wasn't that it was comfortable it was kind of loyal because at that time I had been let go and then brought back by a different general manager Pat McNally and uh, I just I felt I could I could get up and leave Okay, because they promised me syndication and I wasn't getting it, and I could say you didn't live up to your contractual obligations and blah 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 blah, and I could leave. But I liked Pat and I felt loyal to Pat, and I knew how it would impact him if I left. Okay, so I didn't go. Yeah, and it was also because Mel said I will let Alex Bennett come to WJFK if he quits Live 105 first. Well, I didn't know that much about Mel at that point. I didn't trust him. And I figured that if I suddenly quit Live 105 to go to WJFK, once I quit to go to WJFK, they could say, well, we decided we don't want you. And now I'm out in the street with nothing. (laughs) All right? So it was a little bit of my distrust of Mel that made me also turn down that job. And actually, it was a job I should have taken because they were promising me syndication, which they could get me. Uh, and um, you know, I just n- never. And I think they also wanted me because they wanted to get, they wanted to clear the board for Howard, so Howard could come into San Francisco. So it was, it was, uh, you know, uh, that was my big mistake. Well, you you uh, showed what few people do in this business, and that's loyalty. Well, yeah, I felt a little guilty about the whole thing. I mean, I told them that I was thinking of leaving. And in fact, I think we actually gave them notice. And then we decided not to. Because I just didn't like the fact that I had to quit them first. Mel, the reason why Mel wouldn't hire me if I didn't quit them first is he didn't like to appear as though he was poaching somebody. You know, he, he, felt, uh, he felt a certain kinship with other general managers and would not do something that he wouldn't want to have done to the, done to him, you know. So he yeah. wanted me to quit first so he could then hire me and do so with a, a non-guilty conscience, as it were. So that's the business. People are getting an insight into the business. But that would have been a big uh, step to 
pay, pay dump your job uh, and on an oral promise that he's going to hire you. Yeah, yeah, I would be out. On, I, there would be that moment where I would be very vulnerable. I didn't realize now, Mel was always a man of his word. And he would have lived up to that. Yeah, and that was you didn't it. know. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. I heard heard other all the horrible stories about him. You know, nobody runs over Mel Carmazin unless they say they can run, run me over. That's the story yeah. I always heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, hey, listen. Good talking yeah. to you, Larry. Good talking of, to you, buddy. Of course, we're going to do this again next week. You're a regular. <laughs> yeah, keep taking that Metamucil. Anyway, I'm talk, an irregular. <laughs> talk to you later. All right. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its seventh year. Talk like you've never heard it before. And, of course, our good old friend, D.S., the lovely and attractive uh, Larry Bubbles Brown. We love Larry. We just, we, I say that every week, and I'm, I'm absolutely right. We love Larry, okay? Um, so, anyway, here I am. I'm ready to go for another little go-round with people. We'll see if we get anybody calling tonight. Um, I'm freezing up a little bit. No, uh, it's it's getting better. Okay, all righty. I think we're okay. See, the trouble is, I suddenly realized I have a very hard time doing this show um, because it used to be that when I did a show, I had somebody running a board and they ran the commercials, and uh, uh, all I had to care about was what I was saying. I didn't have to worry about the stuff that was going on around me. Here, when I'm, if I try to, like last night, I was trying to do a half hour of just talking. What makes it so difficult for me is because there's so many other things I have to watch out for while I'm talking. And that doesn't make for very good, uh, good radio or internet or podcast or whatever. So maybe I got to get somebody to just run a board for me here and I can just pay attention to talking to you and looking into the camera. And not having to worry about what's going on here and whether I'm, I'm, you know, out of sync and all those things. Um, either that or just give it all up, you know. I found a little thing, for instance, that I can do here on the, uh, on the uh, uh, chat in which I can ask a question like, let me see, should I retire, okay? Should... I retire, you know, because it might be time for me to, to retire. And I, I asked people that, and there's a yes, no there. And uh, I uh, ask your community, and there we go. And now, now the question is up there, and uh, they can, uh, uh, you know, they can answer that question. And I can look back every now and then and see how they're answering it. Well, 100% say no so far. Okay, all right. So far, 100% say no. But who knows, you know, we may have uh, whatever. Anyway, so uh, should I retire? No, 100%. Of course, there are only like about three people there, so it doesn't really matter, all right? Anyway, um, so anyway, I think it's time for us to maybe go to our, uh, our citizen panel uh, there are only three of them waiting here, but uh, I find that some people just wait to come on, and by the time the show's over, we have like about nine people. So let's uh, let's go over to our citizen panel. There they are. There's uh, there's Alan, and there's Charlie, and there is Josh. And shall we all sing? Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Charlie! Happy birthday to you. How was that? Thanks, guys. Yeah? 72 years, uh, trips around the sun. 72 you're, trips you're around 10 years younger than I am. Come on, you're a kid. Yep. You're a kid. You know. <laughs> you know. And, and you're in good health for the most part. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I, I could uh, give you a litany of the things that are wrong with me, and, and really, compared to some other people my age, it's not much, you know. <laughs> I got a little uh, neuropathy, and I got a little of this and a little of that, but basically, what? You know, so uh, good, good health to you. Thanks. How about you? How about you, Alan? Are you in good health? Uh, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's either. I mean, are. actually, I'm very healthy for 
for 63 and as fat as I am, but I got a high PSA test a couple weeks ago. So Really high P How <clears throat> high was it? Well, actually, it, it's normally a below one, but it went to 3.2, which is still in the normal well, that's range. That's in the normal range, yeah. But right away, the urologist wants to do a biopsy. I'm like, oh, mm. wait a minute, slow down a little bit here. Yeah, slow down. You don't you don't go to biopsy till you have at least a 4.0. Right. You know, yep. he's probably looking at the jump and worried about it, you know. It, it is a concern, but, you know, I also have chronic prostatitis and it could be that also it could easily be that oh right. easily be that <clears throat> so i didn't like the way the urologist had we had a video call the other day so i asked for a second opinion let me ask you let me say this to you and this is my advice to you okay until my most recent guy i yeah. have had never had a urologist i liked okay the, and and when i said to somebody my regular doctor Boy, I'm really having trouble finding a really decent urologist. His answer to me was, well, they're weird. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, "That's the we always, in, in medicine, we look upon urologists as weird. Yeah. And I got this urologist who isn't weird. You know, wow. I mean, he did a, he did a, um, he did a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a biopsy on me, but only when he felt it was absolutely necessary. He said, I, right. I don't jump into biopsies that easily. But he, no. had to, he had to do it, and thank God he did, because they found that I had a, a touch of the cancer, as little Richard would say, uh, a touch of the cancer, and uh, it, it, it was taken care of, you know, so yep. what the hell, you know. Yep. I mean, I, they, I, they I'll, I'll do whatever, you know. Um, just to jump from a... I, I understand it went up quite a bit, but it's still in the normal range. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the guy said, I'll offer you a biopsy. And I talked to him in video and he was like strange. And so I yeah, asked him I'll offer you a biopsy. What is this? Like, uh, well, you came in for this and you paid so much. Hey, we'll give you a bonus. I'll give you a biopsy. Yeah. Well, he actually doesn't make any more money from it. It's a, it's Kaiser. So they're all salary paid or, or monthly paid. So he's not going to, so, you know, I, I'll, I, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I don't know. They, they did what they did with my prostate. Now I have all kinds of other little insignificant yep. problems like, you know, hurts when I pee sometimes and I've lost all my sexual drive. <laughs> A few things yeah, like see, that. I'm, I'm still fairly sexually active. And so, you know, he didn't want to hear that. Uh, he didn't know that I have chronic prostatitis. He didn't know anything about me. And I thought, screw this. I'll, I'll get a, a second opinion. He should know a little more about you than that. Right. And yeah. so hopefully the next guy will. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Josh, you're healthy, aren't you? Yeah. 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 I got a few things, I guess. Well, like what? Yeah, tell us. <laughs> well, I mean, we... We talked before off air that I I have the hereditary condition that my father has that is probably going to lead to me not walking very well oh. later. Are you talking oh, about no. neuropathy, maybe, or what is that? No, uh, we there's a disease of the spinal cord that we have that really? causes some pretty severe back and hip oh. issues, which you know i have and he's so he's 60 uh he's 63 and he walks with a walker and he, he can't walk without one yeah well i mean he, sometimes he hobbles with a cane but do you I mean, feel since he, it, since he had that yeah. back surgery i mean he can't drive anymore yeah. do you have any sign of that oh yeah oh really oh really oh yeah oh. because i didn't know that spinal problems could be genetic but apparently they can yeah, they are. be Wow. Wow. No, I mean, it's, it's like, a. um, I have a pretty severe loss of like cartilage and things like that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a incredibly high strength form of like arthritis. Ooh, boy. But it's very, very severe. Oh. Uh, so, um, Mine hasn't been as much with my back as his, but uh, mine has definitely been with uh, both of my hips very bad. Oh, boy. 
Yeah. We're all falling apart. Otherwise, why would we be here? Yeah. Well, Charlie, you're in pretty good shape, I'd say, aren't you? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, all my problems are under control with medication. I, I take 13 pills a day. And that psychosis, the pills take care of that right there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Here, here we yep. are on a on a on a birthday. Here, anybody ever get a hair sticking out of their mm -hmm. nose? Yeah, I know. It drives you crazy. It drives you crazy. Anyway, get uh, a hair nose trimmer. I got I got one of those. They never work. Yeah, mine doesn't work. They go whir whir whir, and then I go. Well, uh, where where's the hairs? They're still there. You just stick the yeah. thing in each nostril, let it cut, and then rinse it out and use a nasal rinse. <laughs> hey, folks, welcome to the old person show, in which we talk about all these things that happen to you when you get old, like hairs in your nose. <laughs> the part I never could get uh, is that why I lost it all up here, but it's coming out of my nose and my ears. Why? <laughs> why is that? You know, and 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 Josh, you're not that old, so you shouldn't be having these kind of problems. But hey, you know. Hey, well, I mean, it's a it's and Jeff, it's pretty lifelong. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, yeah. and, it's and, just the way it is. And Jeff, let's I not, don't mind. Let's not talk about Jeff. I mean, <laughs> little Bobby Stroke over there. You know, somebody somebody that's listening to the show is giving me medical advice. Tony, what? <laughs> on, on, he's listening to the show. He's not on, yeah. but he's on Facebook Messenger and it's, you know, yep. rapid fire messages. Oh, Don't let Alex worry you. Oh, he doesn't oh, know what he's get yourself, about. Get, get blah, yourself, blah, blah, blah. Get yourself one of these and it'll go off every five seconds when he, you know. He, no, I just, you. I turn the phone off and if he sends like 50 messages, I just delete the whole thing without reading them. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, I told them, you know, I'm not going to make you a Facebook friend again if you're going to rapid fire these text messages. Well, the horrible thing with Tony, and the reason why I banned him from, like, getting a hold of me on Facebook and, and texting me <laughs> is because it makes my watch go off. And that's a little little kind of, like, bump, you know, a little beep, a little buzz <laughs> that happens. And uh, I, I keep getting those messages. I don't want them. So. He says he's on his eighth cup of coffee. Oh, really? <laughs> no, he actually wow. didn't say that, but these, these rapid-fire messages make me think it. Hey, well, Tony, don't just sit there. Give us a call. Yeah, really. Get on the show, Tony. You know, we don't mind having you here, Tony. You know. Um, but um, anyways, oh, uh, let's, was there anything happening today that was worth talking about? No, not really. Um, Tony is on the show. He the, says. This guy Avenatti, you know Avenatti, the lawyer, yeah. Stormy Daniels' lawyer. Yeah. Uh, he just got found guilty of wire fraud, wow. having stolen three hundred thousand dollars from Stormy Daniels. And all, uh, all because she had sex with Donald Trump and lied about it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. No. But what happened was he represented her. Yeah. And then he somehow took some money from her or some money that she made went to him or whatever. He was writing a book. Yeah, and he 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 didn't uh, he didn't uh, um, <clears throat> give her the money or whatever. And uh, I don't know the full story, but he's going to jail. He's uh, yeah. he's guilty of. I was watching from. Serpico too. What? I was watching Serpico. What does it have to do with Michael Avenatti? No, I got to tell you why. Because one scene, he's, he's on 57th Street, Alex, and he's talking to internal affairs, and he had the candy machine that you were talking about. And he says, I got to get something to eat. And he starts kicking the machine. Oh, you mean in the subway? In the subway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they used to have candy machines in the subway. And Probably he couldn't right get it out, and he started that kicking that the machine. I was who, like, oh, who man. Would, considering that that's underground, and it gets damp down there, and considering the state of the technology in those days with candy machines, which was you pull the lever, the f stuff comes out, and you don't know how long it's been sitting there because people who were smarter than you didn't buy any candy, and then you eat buy the candy, and how long has it been sitting down there with the rats hanging out, you know, and the and the mold and uh, all of that? Yeah, it was funny, and it's just, he's kicking the machine. He took his money and he's pulling it. He's like, I get. 
because they were sitting in, and he's talking in front of us. They, they're trying to kill me, he says. You know he's, he's on, on coffee when he comes on here. And I'm yeah, talking about, brother watching I'm, I'm talking about one thing. I know, I was all jacked he, up on this, watching the whole movie. <laughs> oh, boy, here we go. Thanks for sending him <laughs> coffee, nice. Alan. Yeah. Well, I'm he's sorry. sending me vanilla coffee, yeah. I, thanks. I have it for the Super Bowl. Really? Hey, you, you said you, that he should get on the show. They made want you open me. me. I watched the opening ceremonies of the uh, Olympics today. Well, how was it? I was I too I did, I walked away from it. I didn't see it, and we didn't go back. My brother was talking when it was going on. Was it nice? Because I hear they kind of a little. They think it's going to get bad ratings. The Olympics over there. So your brother was interrupting the opening. Yeah, he was talking to me about work and his what was going on. In the well, city. I watched it. You see, I I subscribed to Peacock. You they got you. I want to subscribe for the Joe Montana. I didn't give him the five dollars yet. I'm pissed. Is it worth it, Alex Peacock? No. Oh, all right, so I'll save he gets my money. It's free because he's Alex Bennett. No, I didn't get it free because no. I'm Alex Bennett, but I'm paying the nine ninety five because I don't want it with commercials. Oh, I'm trying. I'm putting oh. it on the four ninety five. If I want to watch a documentary, I'm just too cheap. Well, right the trouble now. is, you know, it, it like if you tape something and the commercial comes on, you can speed through the the commercials. If you're watching it online, there's no way you can speed through the commercials. No. And so you really want to get the uh, the non-commercial version. But anyway, yeah. so we watched the opening ceremonies this afternoon because uh, they already had it up there. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it was, you know, compared to the ones in, uh, in 2008, one 2008 was spectacular. And it was thousands upon thousands of human beings on the stage at one time, all pounding on drums. And, you know, it was amazing, if you all remember. This most of it was uh, like sitting. They were sitting there watching a big screen, you know, because oh, it was no. they, it was it was an LED screen that uh, took the entire range of the of the uh, arena plus a thing going up to the ceiling, and it was spectacular the video and stuff they were doing. But it it uh, was kind of you know it what didn't have that same power of human beings doing it. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, but what they did here's 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 what Xi Jinping did. That's uh, his name. Yeah. Yes, that's his yeah, name. Of of China 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 China. China. No. What? What'd you say, Alan? He's the president of China, Tony. Where have you been? Queens. I thought Alex was like a part of the name. No. Xi Jinping. You, no, they, you, no here name. we can do a little <laughs> Abbott and Costello routine. You say. Who's the, who's the president of China? Let's ask me that. Who's the president of China? I'm trying not to wait, laugh. Wait a minute. She is. <laughs> oh, a woman? Really? No, she is. Yeah. I, anyway. I want to be the little fat guy. I like him. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. The little <laughs> fat crazy, guy. Man. How young are you and how old am I that you don't know oh, that's God. Costello? That's, is that Costello? I always get them confused. Yeah. I love me the monsters. I have that on the day. I love that one. He's waking them up. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yeah. uh, they uh, she did a great PR thing today. As you know, they are you know they've been going after and imprisoning and uh, indoctrinating the Uyghurs, which are a group of Himalayan or not Himalayan but Asian, kind of like Himalayans. Uh, who are uh, a, a group up in the north of China, and uh, the Uyghurs, and uh, they're, or is it Uyghurs or Uyghurs? Uyghurs. I've heard it pronounced both ways. You know, Uyghurs so or Uyghurs, I... yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so everybody's, like the president, our president didn't go to the Olympics. Why? Because the way they're treating the Uyghurs. And, and um, a lot of countries didn't go. England didn't go, France didn't go whatever it was just it was kind of putin and she okay yeah so anyway uh at the end of the ceremony the biggest part of the ceremony is the lighting of the olympic oh, yeah. torch of the olympic flame and um there's always one person that does it here it was two people and one of the two people that she chose was a uyghur or a uyghur or a yugger, whatever they're called. They couldn't pick somebody else. Yeah, no, 
What do you mean they couldn't pick somebody else? This is the per politically, this was the yeah. perfect no. person to pick. I know. Because they're saying everybody's saying, oh, they're they're being inhumane towards the Uyghurs and uh That's true. You know, so <laughs> on. And then they, then they went out and got uh got one of them to light the torch. The final torch. You know, not the not the running around. Well, not the big one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I I was asking a question and I maybe somebody can answer me this. The Olympic torch for the Winter Olympics is traditionally lit where? I don't know. I heard it was in a fireplace in, I think, Norway. Really? Oh, yeah, that's at a good the home of the guy who invented uh, uh, some major sport. Uh, really? Does anybody know at all? I don't know. I'd have to Google it. See, yeah, I look, have no idea. Look it up. Uh, somebody look it up, you know? Uh, uh, What's the question and who lights the... Where is traditionally, it wasn't this year, because this year because of COVID, I think they did it in downtown Beijing somewhere. They lit the first one. Um, but usually they lit the first one, I think, in a fireplace that was uh, the, the home of somebody who was very important to the sports, to the winter sports. I think they, they they always used to have one torch that they would light someplace and then they would run it all across the whole world. Yeah, right. Well, it, Olympics. It, Olympia, Greece is the place where they do the Summer Olympics. But the Winter yeah. Olympics, mm -hmm. I think the torch started in a fireplace mm -hmm. in one of the Norwegian countries, but I, I don't know which. You can't find it anywhere, Alan? I can't find it. I yet. can't find it. Hmm. Doesn't say. Hmm. No, that's interesting. Um, hmm. You know. But anyway. Um, so um, uh, anyway, so it was kind of interesting that he he uh, he, you know, made a, a, a got a Uyghur to do it. Um, I don't know that that's going to soften the blow at all, but it was certainly. Well, a he probably took the guy out and shot him after that. No, it was a woman. It was a woman. Oh, shot yeah. her then. Yeah. Well, she, undoubtedly, she's been fully indoctrinated, you know. Uh, but, uh, and then you had, oh, this was great. <laughs> uh, uh, Putin, who is now, you know, thinking about uh, uh, attacking um, the Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> is sitting in the stands. He's there all by himself, by the way, because oh. they're keeping a safe distance. And same thing with she. They gave him a lot of distance, too. I think they just didn't want them to come down with COVID. <clears throat> and he's sitting there, and all of a sudden, uh, here comes the Ukrainian uh, Olympic team. And they walk in. Oh. And then they take a shot of Putin, and he's like this. He's like asleep. Oh, he... And then he wakes up or opens his eyes and sees who's going by and he goes. <laughs> I'm pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. They think that he's going to attack in the next couple of days that he's going to do it during the Olympics. <sighs> I don't think he's going to attack, if you want my opinion. I think we're just too on to him. Okay. What do you think, Josh? I don't know if he will or not. I mean, in some way, what really, uh, I don't think he cares. I mean, what really can we do? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that if he does, you'll get a lot of talk about how, you know, uh, you know, Biden, he let him do it and all this, you know, and I mean, look, after the fact, there's going to be a lot of, things they can do i don't think he's going to care too much about i mean a ton of sanctioning and and things like that i mean right. a lot of maneuvering but at the end of the day i mean do american citizens want to send troops over do they do they want to be involved in a shooting war i think the answer is no so you know i think republicans would love it if he invaded because they could just hammer away at biden about how they're he's gonna you know uh he let it happen, but just two weeks ago, they were hammering away about how he was going to send troops over there and get us involved in a world war. So, I mean, it's fucked either way, you know what I'm saying? So, it doesn't really, 
it's not going to work out. But I, I don't know what Putin will do. I mean, he's a pretty unpredictable guy, but I don't think he cares what, you know, anyone will say about it because if he if he does, I don't think much is going to happen. I mean, unless they're repelled, you know, or something like that and decide it's not going to be worth the blood that might get spilled or something. But I don't know if he cares about that either. Yeah. But at some point, you know, maybe the uh, the people within Russia will care a little bit much and finally maybe make some changes to push him out of there. But uh, I don't see it. Well, um, but if if I had to guess, yeah, he, he's probably he's probably going to do it. Do you think so? I mean, if I just had to lean one way or the other, well, I don't know if it's going to be in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. But well, he did he do. He did go after Crimea and took yeah. it over, right? Uh, and if well, you, right, and I mean, and you know, there was a lot of blame went around for that one too. But uh, like I said, I mean, what what do you want to do? I mean, do you do you want to, you know, I mean, do you want to put troops on the ground and form up a couple fronts and have that? I mean, I just don't, I don't think the American people want to do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't, and I and I. I think that uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure a lot of other people would, you know, pitch in and help, you know, right, you know, they'd probably give us, you know, they'll all send a couple hundred guys or whatever who can like cook our food and you know put air in our tires on our fucking trucks or whatever. But that's not, I mean, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna sacrifice like we would have to. We, we would have to bear the brunt of it. Yeah, and I don't think people want that. Well, you know. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know whether he's going to or not. I don't think so. I think he's just posturing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. I mean, it's uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's some some expensive posturing. Maybe to get something he wants. Yeah. You know, maybe to get something that he wants at at little cost to him. Um, you know, like that's that's what that's North Korea's playbook, right? And by the way, the, at the Olympics been. tonight, it was kind of like both both Putin and Xi going giving the finger to the United States. Like, mm -hmm. you don't want to do business with us? Well, we just sold gas, natural gas, to China. And you know what China's going to do? They're going to sell us, give us some stuff in return. And we don't need you guys. And they really don't right. need us. They really don't need us. You know, uh, um, and, well, and and that's and, why. And no matter what, Apple's still going to make their uh, iPhones over there. You know. Yeah, I mean that's why sanctions or something like that. I mean, can have a lot of really great effects, but at the end of the day, he's not going to care much at all. Because you're sort of right that they really don't have to have. You know, it's, there's nothing that I think that I'm aware of. I mean, unless I'm totally missing the point on something. There's nothing that, you know, America mm -hmm. or Great Britain supplies to Russia that if they were to make this move and we were to take it away, they, they, they would just it would crush them. You know, I can't think of anything. I mean, you know, what are we going to embargo that would make them give in? You know, they're not China's be also been, you know, where they've yeah. also been cozying up to are um, a, a lot of like poorer nations, African nations. They've gone in and built roads for them and so on and so forth and cozied up to them, too. So they got a lot right. more people in this world that are on their side than are on our side. Yeah, I mean, look, it, you know, if his goal was to return to some Cold War posturing, that's out of that. I mean, that's out of the game plan from that era. Right. I mean, yeah. for them to move into areas um that don't seem all that significant, but when you add them up, can certainly be a real pain in America's rear end. You know, well, I mean, I'm, I'm just what did Russia really need from Cuba? You know, in the 1950s yeah. or whatever, but it strategically worked out very well for them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the same kind of thing, I guess, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Russians wanted a, a base in Cuba, 70, right. 90 miles from American soil. Right. You know? Yeah, but I'm just saying on its face, you know, that's the, that's that's the whole point of those things. I mean, they don't care about Cuba or the Cuban people or anything like that, but they can make a deal, you know, and I suppose everybody it works out, you know, well, you know, Cuba, uh, 
Castro and his folks and all the folks around him and just before him that worked with him, they all got what they wanted, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and he, and, uh, the, the Soviet union got what it wanted. So yeah, uh, that's, it's, it might be the same kind of thing here. I well, mean, but, they've been a thorn in our side for, you know, quite a long time and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, by the way, uh, it, it, now it's uh, eighty-six percent for me not to uh, retire. So, oh. so somebody has voted for me to retire. <laughs> so, I can't see the rest of the poll though. I don't know. Is, can anybody see the poll in there in the chat? Because all I get I know is the nose. I must have missed that. Yeah, the nose. Yeah, I don't see it. The nose. Let me see live chat. Yeah, if you click on it, oh, it says. Yeah, four, uh, fourteen eighty-six percent no and fourteen percent yes, yeah, yeah. Well, it certainly makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, we we still want you here. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. That the guy who voted yes is I think Jack Bishop, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, anyway, so, uh, it, you know, you it, think he's that talented that he could do that? Hmm. You think that he could figure out how to vote yes? Uh, well, that's a pro that is a problem. That would be a problem for him. Yes, that would yeah. Be, yeah so. I sent him a thing today. I, I want to see what happens with this. I'm sorry, Jack, if you're listening. We all know your technical prowess. Uh, the the he has an email address. He has uh, jbishop at gabnet dot net. Okay, which is I I. I get a five accounts on my email, so I made him one of them. Uh, today or yesterday, a couple of weeks ago, they sent him things saying they were gonna change their whole system and they were going to like Microsoft 365 or something like that. And uh, they would send it on the day of the changeover, they would send how to do it. So I went and did it and I changed all my accounts so that they all resolve themselves in my, in my mail uh, client um okay but it, it took me a little bit of doing it wasn't really that bad once i figured out how to do it but i sent him an email on how to do it and i want to see what happens <laughs> yeah i want to see what happens he's probably got it set up so the kremlin gets his email that's now. correct that's correct you know but uh and all of a sudden you know they they go over to this microsoft 365 because that's their new mail uh, server okay and uh, all of a sudden Microsoft is trying to sell me stuff you know like would you like to be able to keep your mail beyond its expiration date and whatever here just pay us another 225 a month or 299 a month and we'll save all your mail you know so hello Jack well, here he is he's got to turn his uh, audio on um, I think he can do that uh, there we go. There's Jack. Hello, Jack. Jack? Right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. I have my uh, people taking care of that for me. Oh, really? Yes. It's very simple, you know. The instructions are all there. Well, seeing as how the people I'm having take care of it used to uh, set up things for a major company, and they owe me big time mm -hmm. I said let them do it <laughs> like I said the Kremlin uh, uh, no McC no, they work for McCormick Spice Company <laughs> they used to buy software and hardware oh yeah McCormick is it McCormick Spice. Spice Company or big software people yeah oh yeah yeah well, they're not, but the thing is you know like all companies they had an, uh, an IT division and uh their IT division included my stepson, who now is uh, living in my spare bedroom. Oh, okay. So you've got you've got an on deck got, tech guy. Well, put it this way: I got him by the balls, and I'm squeezing hard. Yeah, this thing will take him five minutes to do. Well, that's why. I, yeah, he's a good kid. I had a few little problems with it because it just took a while for it to to gain traction, and then it worked okay. Well, he's a good kid, and uh, he takes care of the old man quite well. Mm. And uh, 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 seeing as how he's uh, 
going through the reestablishment of a home because I told him never marry somebody who owns the house that you're living in because when they kick you out, you got to come home to mom. You're kicked out. You're kicked out. <laughs> you're kicked out. out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, sorry to hear he's going through that. Oh, look, look. Me and his mother have been married for 34 years. During that time, he's been married four times. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's gee. Not, he's it's he's got... He's, he, well, he, he's 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 got a, he, he's come up to my uh, my my standard. Well, you know, I always thought the fact that I had uh, never been divorced, although I'd been married twice, as you know, my first wife passed away. Yeah. But I, but I always uh, thought that maybe not having as many ex-wives as you have had probably was an impediment to my career. What? Why is that? Motivation. Oh yeah, I, I slept with them for my jobs. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> no, why? Well you, were, well, you see, you were always in states. I think, I think uh, after you left Texas, you were always in states with alimony, right? With alimony? Yeah, yeah. We have no alimony. Oh really? Texas. Well, I've never paid alimony. You dog. The, the, all my wives wanted to get rid of me so badly <laughs> they didn't want to fight for the money. <laughs> Well, that's yeah, with, get off easy. <laughs> well, that's the wow. thing with Don. I, I, you know, uh, he's only had to pay alimony one time, but boy, has he had to pay child support. Oh well, you see, like here's the thing: the reason I did okay in my career is I never had any kids. Yeah. So I here. could I could just pick up and leave and go somewhere yeah. to for, to get a job. Where somebody who has kids has to think, well, you know, I got to mm -hmm. move the kids and the family, and maybe I better stay here and become a real estate broker. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. But with me, it was just a matter of how do I get the next job? You know, yeah. oh, you know, uh, I got to go out to New York to get a job. Fine, I'm not getting paid anything for doing it initially. Fine, you know. I mean, I just it it made it a hell of a lot easier for me to make decisions about whether where I was going to go. Well, well, you know what my problem was. I I got here after, you know, moving in the early part of my career four, four or five times, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I got here and I liked it. I mean, although I bitch about the weather, although I bitch about the politics, I uh You like made, it. People don't, made, people don't understand this. People don't understand this and I think Charlie would probably agree with this. Texas is a great place to live. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. this, especially if you're living in one of the major cities. If you're living mm -hmm. in Houston's a great city. In many ways. And, and I felt very bad leaving it. As a matter of fact, at a certain point, things were very bad for me. I didn't have, a, I wasn't on a radio station at the time. I was just uh, out of work on a radio station. Still doing the Midnight Blue here in New York, but that wasn't making me any money. And all of a sudden, I get a call from Houston, Texas. And they offer me a job to come back to Houston to work. I can't remember where it was now, to tell you the goddamn truth. And uh, I thought about it, and I said, nah, I don't want to go back there. That's going backwards. I want to I want to move sideways, okay? Mm -hmm. And I turned that job down, and a week later, I got offered the job in San Francisco, mm. which mm. turned out to be my golden job, okay? Of all the jobs that I've had, that's the one where I was the most successful. But, you know, the ability to say no was very simple uh, because uh, it didn't matter to me. I, I could hold out for the next thing to see what was going to happen next. And I think that's when people have the biggest problems is they get married and they have kids, and then now it's, oh, I've got to move to Houston or I've got to move to uh, uh, San Francisco. Uh, gee, I don't know if I want to move the wife and kids. The kids have school here, blah, 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 you know. So I never had that, all right? And my pure selfishness, I guess, is what allowed me to be successful in this business, you know, so. Well, I got offered, it was a couple of years after I had left Houston, and uh, I was in a job that I thought was going somewhere and it turned out it wasn't well you know so it's I, never that way usually at mcdonald's 
Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know. So anyway, I get it like you, I get a call to not only go back to Houston, but to go back to the station I was at at Houston for a, a little bit more money than I was making. Hmm. And the only thing that stopped me was I said, you know, as much as I had going for me in Houston, and I did pretty mm -hmm. good, it would be a move backwards. And how do you measure? Well, let, let me ask. Let me ask Charlie mm -hmm. something. Charlie, you have some kids, right? Right. Did you ever have to make business decisions based upon the fact that you had those kids? Sure. See, I never had to do that. Uh, how How about? Uh, well, uh, let's see here. How about you, Jeff? Turn on your microphone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you... I agree with you guys. I, I had to do that several times. Yeah. You would have made different decisions if you didn't have kids, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I could have been handling all the laser printers in the Caribbean and South America, but I wasn't going to move for my kids. Yeah. Laser printers? For who? They see yeah, I... I worked for Xerox. I was an analyst uh, that uh, was technical support for all the laser printers that Xerox has all over the country. Boy, you probably could get all the toner you wanted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I might even have wanted the toner. It's amazing what turns Alex on. Toner. I never knew that about you. Yeah. Well, ever since we started talking about this, we lost about 10 listeners. So we better... Oh, we I don't know. I mean, you know, talking about Xerox. I mean, Xerox... It invented the modern copier. Yeah. Yes. The technology is called xerography. Yeah. Yeah, but do we really need Xerox? And do we need Xerox anymore? I mean, we've got printers. They print pretty fast. We got laser printers. They print pretty fast. I don't need them anymore. I'm retired. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Did, now, how did you work for Xerox for a long period of time? Uh, for seven years, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Were they good to work for? Uh, the first three. <laughs> well, what happened in the last four? Well, the, the laser printer started making money for Xerox, and so the copier division took over the laser di division, and we had, we had a bunch of executives that didn't know anything about computers making all the si decisions. You, you, you know, I, I feel bad for people who work in companies that get, get, then get absorbed by other companies because mm -hmm. the company they went to work for and the company they loved is then taken over by an entirely different culture. Yeah. And that's what's happening over at CNN right now uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Jeff, uh, what's his name, getting, uh, uh, oh, yeah. quitting. Uh, the people there, the on-the-air people, are griping publicly about uh, about him leaving and about the way the new company is treating them because what's happening is AT&T is selling CNN to Discovery. Oh, wow. I All right? That. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and, and because of that, they don't want anything that's going to be a problem in, the, in being able to have Discovery buy them up. Okay, in oh, in the yeah. government. So that's why they asked uh, Jeff. What's his name? I'm trying to remember his last name now. Is it Zucker? Or? Zucker. Jeff Zucker. Uh, yeah. They asked mm -hmm. Jeff to Zucker. They told Jeff Zucker, "Well, we can't have you doing this." I mean, all he did was he was having a relationship with a woman he had known for twenty years. Yeah. Mind you, twenty years. And one day they looked at each other, as many people do occasionally, and go, "You know, we've been friends for twenty for 19, 18 years now." we take this thing to the next level you know we we like each other we appreciate each other and so they started having a relationship but he didn't report it to the company which was the rule of the company that if you have a relationship with anybody okay. in the company you've got to report it which i think is this i think is disgusting can i keep who i'm fucking to myself i mean that's you know? kind of rude is it well, no, they had that no. way back in the eighties when I was at Xerox. Yeah. yeah, but the reason is, is that they were they were bothered by this because well, how does this affect our merger? And yeah. and now uh, all the people who are working there, at uh, at at CNN, a lot of the like Wolf Blitzer and so on, they're all oh complaining to the press that we don't know what's going to happen to this company now that Zucker is gone 
because he was the glue that kept it together. And he was the glue that was going to continue to keep it together if it went over to, over to Discovery. And now he's gone. And he was a mentor to all of them. He liked them. He thought they, they thought he was terrific. He did, nobody in the press was saying a bad word about Zucker. I'm sure there's somebody that hated him, you know. Mm. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I know uh, 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 Trump hates him mm-hmm. because of CNN and the way they treated oh, him. Yeah. But you know what the worst thing is about Zucker? He's mm-hmm. the guy who gave you Donald Trump. Yeah. who put him on The Apprentice and made uh-huh. him a star. If he had not done The Apprentice... Off with his head. If, his head. Huh? Yeah, if, if, if Zucker had not given him The Apprentice, he probably wouldn't have wound up being president of the United States. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you want to think bad about Zucker, that's something to think bad about him. And he didn't do it because he liked Trump. He just thought, hey, here's a guy who knows how to handle the media, be very good at doing a show like this, and we need a, a billionaire to host the show. So they went and got him. Uh, but um, Trump hated him while he was in office, and he shouldn't have hated him because Zucker gave him the presidency. Yeah, but, you know, but but Trump figured he did it on his own. Did Nobody helped him. He was He's the yeah. smartest guy in the world. Yeah. Well, if he didn't get the, the, the uh, think about it, if he didn't get The Apprentice, do you think he would have been president of the United States? No. How would, any, voted for him. how would anybody uh-huh. in the middle of America know who the hell Donald Trump right. was if he didn't yeah. have a TV show? Right? So. Wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So, but, uh, but here, here, that's what happens though. You, you have great companies and all of a sudden they're taken over by another company and all of a sudden the whole the whole culture of that company changes as a result of that and you wonder why did that company suddenly start doing so badly well they were sold to somebody else now who knows discovery may buy it and they may be a wonderful bunch of people and they understand the news division and they'll let it happen but so far as i know the thing they know the most about is like cooking shows and uh, you know all the all the uh, discovery network has a lot of networks I mean it's a it's a huge uh, group uh, and and they're buying CNN uh, CNN a company that was owned at one point by Warners uh, and then later on was owned by uh, uh, AT&T didn't Ted Turner start it the Ted yeah. Tur- and Ted Turner started it yeah in the very beginning it was Ted Turner Cable uh, News Network. I would love to interview Ted Turner and ask him what he thinks of CNN uh-huh. these days, because mm-hmm. his concept of CNN was a whole different concept. Yeah, I remember when that first came out. They 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 had an interview with him, and they said when he proposed like the idea, they were looking at him like he was crazy, like he was all the time. They're like, that's never. Gonna I work. remember watching CNN the first day it went on the air. Oh, you watched it? We didn't have and I cable. remember the first thing they said. What they say? This is CNN signing on for the last time. Because mm. they never go off. Yeah, because oh, they never go yeah. off. And that's they were 24-hour news, and everybody went, oh, that's not going to work. But it worked, mm. you know. Yeah. So, well, Don't the, you find that people in media, the, the, the suits in media, are generally opposed to any new idea? Mm. But well, they're, always... they're, 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 they're opposed to any idea that hasn't existed before. Yeah, Once it exists and is successful, they all want to do it. Yeah. You know, uh, but that's because they don't, they lack imagination. Ted Turner, you know how Ted Turner started CNN? Is one night he was watching the CBS Evening News and he saw Dan Rather and he said, read something or something and he smirked. And he said, I want to start a network that doesn't do that. And his idea for CNN was never smirk, never have an opinion about the story you're reading. Read it, read it as honestly as possible, but don't have an opinion about it. And don't enforce that opinion upon your audience. I want a non-prejudicial news source. And that's what he created. And it was that way for years until, you know, he left and then somebody else took it over and, you know, uh, Fox came along and, 
they were opinionated, so you had to become opinionated. But his whole concept was news without opinion. Yeah. And if you had opinion, they had a show called Crossfire. Okay. Watch, yeah. In which they would then have opinion on that show. Uh, what what's been your opinion over the years, Josh, about about uh, CNN? Have you had have you had a? Um, I used to really like it long, you know, long time ago, and uh, I, you know I don't hardly watch too much cable news anymore. I mean, it's okay. It's it seems to be the one that I would go to because it does have more like news at times. It's not completely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like opinion driven all the time. Yeah. So it has a, you know, a little bit more newsy type stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it's gotten a little bit out of hand at night because it's just like the other two networks now where they don't really do any news. They just do a lot of telling you sort of what they think about what's happening, which yeah. I don't really consider news. What I've know? never, I mean, what I've never got definition, what I've never gotten about that is why at night on like Fox and on CNN and on MSNBC, all the nighttime shows are opinionated shows. Yeah. Why isn't it just news right. like the rest of the day? That's what we yeah, wanted. I mean, <laughs> they used to be that way. I mean, I mean, you know, I used to really enjoy, I mean, I remember Crossfire. I mean, it had, you know, Bill Press, I think like John Sununu or somebody was a guest all the time. Yeah. Yeah, a um, couple guys. You know, I liked Crossfire, and uh, used to do a long time ago every day, like three or four o'clock. This uh, Inside Politics it was Judy Woodruff and what Bernard Shaw or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, that mm -hmm. stuff was great. Um, you know, they had Larry King all those years. Uh, some of the I didn't care for him every night because he would interview a lot of stupid people, but. Uh, but he was great for years, you know. He had, they, they would they hit politics, and all even the time I think and, even with with you know? uh, with Larry King, he, Larry King never had an opinion, did he? Not that I could remember. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah I don't remember anything. You know, jumps out or controversial or anything like that. He was just kind of a. I mean, he, he would just know, interview the newsmakers, interview stars, and so on and right, so forth. You know, and and and, and it and most of the time they would try to tie it to the the current events yeah you know it wasn't just complete nonsense or whatever you know around large elections or big events a lot of times they would have people on that could uh you know if you were running for president or something like that mm -hmm. you know you you would almost always yeah. have one big important larry king interview well, that was almost embedded into that was a big part of the campaign you know to all the kids out there listening uh, to this uh, when I started out doing talk at WMCA in New York, well, actually, I did first did talk. Where did I first do talk? First did talk in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I did a talk show in, in, in Houston, but I was the only talk show on the station. Uh, and that's where I did my first talk show. But uh, when I, when I, especially when I came to New York, when you did talk and you were on talk station, there are a whole bunch of people doing talk shows, obviously but they didn't all have the same opinion. Some were to the right, some were to the left, some were in the middle, and it was just a matter were they good talkers. Uh, I did my show and I right after me, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bob Grant went on right after I went off the air. And Bob Grant was this big right winger. And then he was followed by somebody else who was to the left. I mean, it was, you, you didn't have a station that was all this or all that. You remember the days, don't you, Jack? Sure, but you see what happened. I, did. Now, I, I say this, that... I thought that was more interesting, by the way. It, it was. It was. Yeah. Uh, but I say this. What happened was the suits realized that the audience were kind of like two-year-olds. You know, two-year-olds want macaroni and cheese. Don't give me no broccoli. No, wait a minute. Like I don't think I. I don't think they looked at them that way. I think they turned them into that. Really? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll I think, but it, you know, if you start supplying people with a steady diet of one kind of thing, after a while, they accept that. But the fact was that you know, radio was far more interesting when you had a station with all these varying opinions, mm -hmm. and sometimes the, the two people would cross over and yell and scream at each other for a couple of minutes while they went, went, yeah. when they went from but, one show to. In other words, having the same 
uh, the same politics on all day long is like playing the same song over and over again. Well, let me say something about that. The guy that made me aware of what we did and still do in American broadcasting uh, with talk and with music was Tom Jones. I once interviewed Tom Jones, and I, oh, and I, I said to him, you do all different kinds of music. You do pop, you do R&B, you do rock. What do you owe your versatility to? And he said, the BBC. Really? And he listened to it in Wales, where the format for the music was uh, varied. You know, well, no, but uh, it, was, it was varied here, too. Uh, but, for, but but not to the extent. I uh, mean, to no, that ex no, to that extent. I mean, you had Frank Sinatra at number three, and you had uh, Elvis Presley in number one, and you had. Uh, but, uh, but how many uh, radio stations really did that? Uh, all of them. Really, all of them. That was the, that was top. That was top forty. See, I, still I, can't, to the I, top can't remember, I can't remember that. Top I mean, 40 wasn't all rock music. Top 40 had Steve Lawrence, and then it had Elvis Presley, and then it had Chuck Berry, and then it had Little Richard. You know, it was a, the, it, the rotation was, a, was amazing. See, I'd rather listen to that. I listened to the old Top 40 uh, the, from, like, they played on Sirius or, like, from that year, like, 1976, and you hear all different No, but the like trouble this. is that this Top 40 they're playing is only one genre of Top 40. If I played oh. you a Top 40 list from the 19, early 1960s, ah. before the Beatles, it was all over the place. See, all like over the listen. place. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I mean, uh, you remember that, don't you, Charlie? Yeah, it was that because right? uh, yeah. you would get rhythm and blues on the same station that you would get, uh, you know, rock and... Yeah. Motown and all well, I, I, uh, 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 there was a guy who became the head of talk programming at Clear Channel, which was the biggest chain in the country. And one time he came up to me and he said, uh, we can't have you on our station because you're to the left and talk is right wing. That's what he said. Oh, talk really? is right wing. And I said, isn't that a little boring? And he said, I said, you know, it's kind of like playing the same. He said, well, on radio, if you play rock, you have to play rock and roll all the time. And I said, but you're, you're, you can't equate it with that. And the fact was, I said, there was a time when they didn't do that. And I said, now what you're doing is you're not giving people a variety of opinion that makes things interesting because that's what gives you the dynamic, that what's, that's what gives you the, you know. So stations either became right wing radio stations or left wing. And most of the radio stations in this country, I'd say 95% of them at one point were all right wing. All of them. So, you know, that's what happened. So, Hey, listen, I got a scoot, but uh, oh, you, enjoy you, it. What, you got enjoy something it. to do? You got something to do? Yeah, yeah, you know, I do this thing following some oh, clown oh. named Alex Bennett it, called it, the Yeah, Internet. because then he starts playing a theme song. And... Uh, yeah, that means you really got to go. It means we'll I really got to move. We'll see you later, Jack. Thank you. Oh, thank you, pal. Thanks to Alan tonight. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much, Charlie Wallace. I hope people didn't mind the... Well, we really weren't doing radio talk. We were doing talk about variety and just show business. Um, uh, Charlie, happy birthday. What are we? You're 73 now or 72? 72. 72. Okay. Uh, Josh, thank you so much. Uh, maybe I'll see you another time, like tomorrow night or something. Yeah. Perhaps. Nothing that you all you have anything to do with. Jeff, you didn't say a word tonight, I don't think, did you? He said one, one thing. But I love having you there, you know. And, of course, uh, 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 <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for being with us as well. Why don't all of you kind of give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you, and we'll call it quits for tonight, okay? Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend, okay? Anyway, that's our citizen panel for tonight, and uh, let me uh, just dump them out of here um, so that I can get rid of them. Come on. Go. There we go. Okay. Anyway, I that's it for tonight for me. Uh, that's it for the week for me. 
Uh, I will be back again on Monday at 4 o'clock on Facebook with uh, Alex Bennett's Pop-Up, which is our most popular show uh, that uh, um, YouTube constantly misreports. That's part of the problem I'm having with them now. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. Nah, fuck. Anyway, and also, uh, uh, I'll see you again, uh, what is it, on, uh, on uh, next uh, Wednesday at 10.30. Same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her. And by the way, please, get vaccinated. If you've been vaccinated, get a booster. And if you don't do any of those things, better goddamn well wear a mask or I don't want to hang around you. Have a nice night, everybody. The Intersection is next with Jack Bishop.